in the last lecture of this course, we will use erosion modeling as an example of geospatial modeling of landscape processes. We will explain erosion and sediment transport as an example of concepts and we will show different applications. Then we will describe methods for geospatial modeling of erosion and we will also show how we can simulate impact of land use on these processes. So why do we want to model erosion and sediment flow? The main reason is sustainable land use management. To design proper and effective conservation measures, we need to know and understand spatial pattern of water flow and sediment transport and we need to be able to identify sediment sources and sinks. GIS implementation of erosion and sediment uh, transport simulations allow us to support efficient management of georeference data that are needed as input parameters we can com compute and derive these input parameters for different land use scenarios and conservation scenarios. Then after the simulation, GIS provides tools for spatial analysis of the simulation results and also for visualization and effective communication of these results. So to model landscape process, we need to define model components. First of all, we need to decide what will be the modeled physical quantities. And for erosion and sediment transport, we will need to model water flow or water discharge because that will be the quantity that will carry the sediment. Then we need to model sediment flow rate then we need to define configuration space and this configuration space essentially defines initial conditions. It's usually elevation surface that uh, controls the fluxes in landscape and then we need to define interactions between physical quantities that we need to model to obtain realistic or adequate simulations or adequate representation of the modeling process. So for example, we need to uh, capture rainfall interaction with soil that leads to infiltration and that controls the amount of water available for runoff. Then we need to model the interaction between flowing water and soil that leads to erosion and sediment transport. And, all, and these interactions need to be defined by governing equations. So what kind of erosion processes can we, are we interested in? Erosion processes generally are driven by water, wind and gravitation. So we can have hill slope erosion and deposition, which I'm sure everybody has seen. Uh, it's sheet and real erosion, which is very common, uh, even on very small, bare hill slopes, and then gullies uh, that are uh, formed in larger areas. Then there are fluvial processes, such as channel evolution, meandering, that's another type of erosion. Then we have also coastal erosion due to waves and storm surge, wind erosion and sediment transport, then gravitation controls uh, the debris flows and landslides and of course people also cause lots of modification of topography. So here are just small examples of the most common erosion processes caused by flowing water and this is, uh, this is uh, real, ero uh, real erosion on cut slope, this is a real erosion actually on a, um, on a lawn. And here are some huge gullies. If we want to uh, model erosion and deposition by water, our modeled quantity will be sediment. 
expressed as mass per area per time. And the configuration space and interaction will include rainfall intensity, then runoff, that would be the flowing water, then soil erodibility, then it is also controlled by land cover, and then topography. We already said that topography controls the direction of flow and also the velocity of flow. The governing equations can be empirical or physics-based. It is also important to define modeled time period. Most erosion models that are used, for example, in agriculture, model average annual soil loss rates or erosion deposition rates based on average impact of many storms. But because uh, uh, the, the highest erosion rates are usually due to a single very uh, strong storm, event-based simulations are very important. And then for regional scale long-term planning, we do continuous time simulations, which, where we usually run simulation for several years. And uh, these simulation systems usually include not only uh, rainfall runoff and sediment transport, but also growth of vegetation, evapotranspiration, and many other processes that influence uh, how much water will be available and how much the soil will be protected during each storm. How do we link these models with GIS? That very much depends on the type of model. Uh, Simple empirical models can usually be run as workflows using standard GIS tools, map, algebra, watershed analysis tools. Then, then there are a couple of fully integrated process-based models, such as SIMWI in, in GRASS. Then there are linked external models, and those are usually complex modeling systems such as SWAT, which is linked with ARC um, GIS or MAP windows. And then there are also some of these uh, uh, models are available as online tools. And then they have web GIS components that allow you to define your area and derive the inputs. And then there are standalone models uh, the, where you need to exchange the data um, between GIS and these models. So here is an example of geospatial erosion models uh, based on the equations. They model different components of the erosion process and they can provide vastly different results. So for example, the most common universal soil loss equation that uses slope, hill slope length as a measure of water flow will produce spatial pattern that looks like this. So you can see there is only erosion, the red color is erosion, the blue color is deposition. So USLE with hill slope length will only show where we have high potential of uh, erosion based on how steep and how long the slope is, but there is no impact, for example, of water flow convergence. To incorporate water flow convergence, we need to replace the slope length with upslope area. If we replace slope length with upslope area, we get pattern like this. So you can see we introduce effects of concentrated water flow in these areas and then we can predict for example high risk for gullies but this still doesn't include erosion and deposition then if we model uh, sediment transport and then we can then we can compute erosion and net erosion and 
deposition as a change in sediment transport, where the amount of sediment in water increases, we get erosion, and where where the sediment transport capacity of water decreases, we get deposition. And you can see in this profile, this blue cross section shows where deposited material was found. And you can see that it fits quite nicely with the predicted pattern of erosion and deposition. And uh, uh, very often, the most sophisticated models can, mo can predict the shifting of this erosion and deposition boundary, which is somewhere here. In the simpler model, it will be at the highest, it will be essentially at the inflex point, inflex point of the topography. These more sophisticated models can predict shifting of this boundary between erosion and deposition based on the conditions that influence sediment transport capacity. For example, based on type of the flow or, or type of the soil or uh, land cover. So here is an example of the simplest most commonly used erosion model, which is called the Revised Universal Soil Loss Equation. It is empirical model, which was based on standard plot experiments. And it, so it is derived from experiments and it provides either annual or event-based estimate of soil detachment um, expressed as amount of soil that is eroded from a unit area per unit time. And it's usually ton per acre per year. And here are the parameters that are used. It is rainfall intensity, soil erodibility, hill slope length, or contributing area if we want to include what impact of water flow convergence. And here you can see the difference. This is the, the spatial pattern that uses uh, hill slope length as a measure of amount of water. And this is the result that when we use contributing area or flow accumulation as measure of water flow. And then another parameter is slope steepness. We already talked about how it controls the water flow velocity. Then it is the cover parameter, which uh, represents the ratio between the uh, erosion on bare soil and uh, the given land cover. And then it is impact of protection measures. And all of these parameters can be derived in GIS from land use, soil, and elevation layers. Here are models that predict erosion and deposition. And we already said that erosion and deposition is computed as a change or divergence of sediment flow. And then there are more sophisticated models that solve continuity equation for sediment flow. And they include uh, relation between sediment transport capacity and sediment flow. Here is an example that, uh, uh, that illustrates that uh, it is quite important how these models and how these concepts are implemented and what kind of equations are used. This is, for example, observed spatial distribution of colluvial deposits. So this is where we have some deposition. And then if we compute erosion deposition as a change in sediment flow along one dimensional flow line, we get the deposition correctly here, 
but we miss the deposition in these areas. And you can see that it, it's quite different here. If we compute erosion and deposition as divergence of two-dimensional sediment flow, so we use Biverried equations, then we can capture the impact of flow convergence and divergence in a much better, much more realistic, more accurate way. He, this example shows that depending on the soils, we can have different types of erosion regimes. And the first one happens when we have lots of water flowing over, uh, over landscape where the soil has very small detachment capacity. So it's very hard to detach it. And then the, uh, the soil erosion on the hill slope will be relatively small, but there will be no deposition. So everything that's eroded is, uh, is transported to the outlet. Then we can have a soil that has high erodibility, but it fills water with sediment very quickly and then it starts deposit, uh, to deposit in concave areas. And the resulting pattern is very different. We have high erosion, but also high deposition but the amount of sediment at the outlet is about the same. So the spatial pattern of erosion and deposition is very different, but the sediment transport through the outlet is the same. So you can see that different regimes of erosion and deposition can lead, or different spatial patterns of landscape process can lead to same result if we monitor only at the outlet, only at a single point. So here is an example of uh, a computation of sediment transport using the particle uh, sampling or path sampling method that we have already explained for uh, water flow simulations and for these two different types of uh, uh, different types of um, uh, sediment. So here the sediment, here we have lots of sediment coming off the of uh, disturbed areas, but with the uh, with the uh, for example with the sand, the sediment won't get too far and will get deposited very quickly. With clay, you can see that here in the streams we have very high sediment um, sediment concentrations much higher than in this case and that's because clay is much harder to erode but once it is eroded it does not deposit. This illustrates the path sampling method. It's dependent on the, uh, on the number of particles uh, that are used for simulation and it also explains why we need a smooth uh, digital elevation model and smooth solution of the sediment transport if we want to get a nice smooth result for erosion and deposition. You can see this is the sediment flux and I said that we compute the erosion and deposition as a change or divergence in this sediment flux and that's computed using derivatives and if the surface is noisy we get noisy result. If it is smooth we get nice net erosion and deposition. Let's look at it once more. So you can see as the surface gets smoother the the pattern just pops out, is really pulled out. You can see very nice simulation of these uh, uh, alluvial cones here. So again, that's what you get when you are using Biverried equations. Here is the uh, simulation of impact of change in land use pattern. This is the original land use and uh, uh, with this original land use, the grass, the protective grass was uh, put on steep hill slopes. 
However, even with this protection, we see a lot of sediment coming out and indeed they had co uh, the problems with gullies were quite common here for very strong storms. So this would be the sediment flow and this is net erosion and deposition pattern. So you can see that in this grassy area there is relatively low erosion and deposition. There is much higher erosion and deposition in this bare or agricultural area, but there is very high erosion here due to concentrated flow. Now, how can we find a better uh, land use pattern to minimize the sediment transport out of this watershed? So what we can do, we can simulate uh, erosion pattern for the situation where everything is bare and that those were the examples that I have shown previously uh, so with homogeneous bare soil then we find identify those areas that have the highest erosion and we put grass in those areas so those were these convex top of the hill slopes and the areas with concentrated flow so if then we have replaced the grass with the exact same amount of grass or same grass area as here but a different spatial pattern and this is the sediment flow that we get and you can see the sediment transport out of the watershed completely disappears why does it disappear here we have the erosion deposition pattern so we have a little bit of erosion on the top then as that eroded material hits the grassy area, it deposits. Then clean water leaves this grease, uh, grassy area and starts to erode. But this is where topography get con gets concave, water slows down and it deposits. And then it hits another grassy area. So whatever is still left in water deposits here. So you can see that this pattern uh, changes the erosion and deposition in such a way that it does not allow any sediment uh, or only very little sediment coming out of the watershed. And uh, we will talk about more examples, more application in the next section.